I'd like to, uh, we're going to, we're going to speak for only an hour today. So we might as well just get rushed right into things. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm the head of the Farzani Family Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies. And before introducing our speaker today, let me um, talk about, uh, let me say something nice about the Farzani brothers, Muhammad and Jalal, because they, it's through their generous support of the College of International Studies and the University of Oklahoma more generally. Um, not only have they been the key to building this Farzani Center, which has four professors now and, um, and a Persian instructor, but they fund an architecture program, the fine, uh, a, a fine Persian music series, and, um, and they've funded other programs in Oklahoma across the straight state. So these are really committed patrons who've done an incredible amount for Iran studies in Oklahoma and for Oklahoma education. So we're very grateful to them. And I'd like to thank also uh, Marjan Sarafipour, who has helped to organize this, along with Stephanie Sager. So um, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker today, Ali Vaiz. Ali is the Crisis Group's Iran Project Director and Senior Advisor to the President of the Crisis Group. He has um, consulted closely with all sides in the nuclear negotiations between Iran and the P5 plus one that led to the 2015 nuclear deal. He led Crisis Group's efforts in helping to bridge the gaps between the parties. Formerly, he served as the Iran Project Director uh, at the Federation of American Scientists. He was a senior political affairs officer at the United Nations uh, Peace Building Affairs. He's an adjunct professor at uh, Georgetown University, and he's now teaching a course on Iran's uh, security strategy. And um, he's also a fellow at Johns Hopkins SICE. He's trained as a scientist. He has written widely on Iranian affairs and is a regular contributor to many of the best papers like the New York Times and Washington Post. And um, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. He's got a wonderful nesseb of universities and degrees. I won't go into them all because you will all feel jealous. And, um, and despite restoring the tooth, well, let me just jump now uh, into and let me welcome Ali Vaiz. Thank you for joining us. Great pleasure. Okay, first question. I'm going to let me just tell the uh, our, our participants today the format here. We're going to speak for an hour. I'm going to ask several questions of uh, Ali Vaiz first, but I'll take less than half an hour. And then we'll switch to questions from uh, all of you. And I would ask you then to write them into the Q&A section. If you will write them the questions and introduce yourself, say who you are, so I know, um, you know who you are, and I will try to get to as many of the questions as I can during that second half an hour of the talk. Okay, first question. Uh, we're stuck in these negotiations, it would seem, and dis despite restoring the, the nuclear deal, Iran and the U.S. seem to be stuck in a, in a you-first trap. They're unable to find a diplomatic path forward, and um, can you give us an update on where the two sides stand and if they are talking behind the scenes? Thank you very much, uh, Joshua and uh, the Farzana brothers for having me today. Um, I have to start by saying Oklahoma has a special place in my heart because two of my aunts actually uh, live in Oklahoma with, with their families. And it's the place where I celebrated my first uh, uh, Thanksgiving in the United States. Um, so. I'm a big fan of Oklahoma, and that's why this is a uh, particular pleasure for me. Wow. Um, now, um, uh, please bear with me when I explain the dynamics uh, right now, because it's infinitely complicated. Um, and this might be a classic case uh, in which the age old proverb of uh, when there is a will, there is a way might not necessarily apply. Um, let's first start uh, with the US's uh, position. 
Uh, now, as you know, the Biden administration came to office with the president uh, having promised during the campaign that he wants to restore the nuclear deal, the 2015 nuclear deal, JCPOA, uh, through a um, uh, formula that, uh, that he put forward, which is compliance for compliance. The U.S. comes back into compliance with its commitments and Iran does the same. Um, now, restoring compliance on the U.S. side means that the U.S. would have to lift most of the sanctions that the Trump administration uh, imposed on Iran. And by definition, that's something that is extremely unpopular in Washington. Uh, as you remember, not only uh, none of the de Republicans in Congress voted in favor of the JCPOA in 2015, but also key Democrats uh, opposed it. Uh, including the current majority leader, Senator Schumer, and uh, uh, Senator Menendez, who's now the head of uh, the Senate's Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, and the administration at this stage really needs Congress in order to push forward its domestic agenda, uh, also in order to get uh, key uh, officials in the administration confirmed uh, by Congress. So it has to be extremely cautious, and it can't really afford to alienate uh, uh, the Senate um, too quickly. Um, and that, I think, the fact that the administration has a very thin margin uh, in the Senate uh, has pushed it to um, uh, be extremely uh, cautious. And this has taken uh, the, the, the form of uh, several red lines for the administration. One is that there would not be any unilateral action. The U.S. would not make any down payments uh, or purchase any entry tickets uh, to the negotiating table uh, with, with the Iranians. Uh, and that's why what we have seen from the administration so far is mostly symbolic steps, like they rescinded uh, a, uh, an effort, uh, widely dismissed and uh, failed effort by the Trump administration to snap back the UN sanctions against Iran. And they've also removed some of the restrictions on the movement of Iranian diplomats uh, in New York. But they haven't really touched the sanctions regime, the sanctions architecture itself. They haven't really offered Iran any meaningful sanctions relief, even on humanitarian issues. Uh, they didn't do anything to facilitate uh, a, an emergency loan that Iran had requested from the International Monetary Fund in order to fight the pandemic. Uh, they haven't really uh, tried to facilitate Iran's access to uh, its frozen assets abroad in order to purchase COVID vaccines or other humanitarian goods. Uh, so nothing on sanctions relief so far. Um, in parallel, the administration launched a broad uh, consultation process uh, in, in Washington with, with Congress, both House and Senate, uh, as well as with allies in Europe and partners in the region. And part of this was uh, to try to address a critical question, which is that if they go back into the JCPOA and lift all the sanctions, would Iran still have incentives to negotiate a follow-on agreement? Because as you've heard um, administration officials saying repeatedly in the past few weeks, they believe that 2015 is not 2021, and the deal that was uh, you know, a good deal uh, at that point uh, is now six, seven years into its implementation, and it's getting closer to some of the sunsets in the deal when uh, uh, critical limits will expire in a few years. So there is a need for a longer and stronger uh, nuclear deal uh, right now, and the administration really does not know if it lifts all the sanctions, Iran would still be interested uh, in negotiating a, a follow-on agreement. Now. Uh, I think in parallel to these symbolic steps and the debate inside the administration about uh, a follow-on agreement, they committed a few mistakes uh, that were totally avoidable. Uh, they started a, uh, an immature, I think, uh, uh, and, and public feud about who needs to go first uh, to come back into compliance. It was totally unnecessary. You know, I've seen this movie before. There's always questions about sequencing that could be resolved behind closed doors and quietly. When you make it public, by definition, you make it much more difficult uh, to, to find a mutually acceptable solution. Uh, it also started the blame game by saying that if Iran doesn't move forward, doesn't come to the negotiating table, uh, it, it would be uh, seen as the inflexible party at fault and it would be blamed internationally. And again, that was, I think, uh, unnecessary and, and uh, totally immature. 
It has also adopted a very tough uh, rhetoric on Iran, uh, which in many ways indicates more uh, continuity than change, honestly, compared to, to the Trump administration. Um, but after about six weeks, I can say that uh, my understanding is that the debate within the administration has now come to an end. Uh, and the administration uh, has decided that it's uh, basically has ended up where it started, which is that the best path forward is to first restore the JCPOA fully as it was, uh, and then use that as a platform to build a uh, better nuclear deal uh, on top of it and also try to address other areas of disagreement with Iran, like its ballistic missiles program or its regional activities. Now, let's turn the lens and look at it from the Iranian perspective. Now, obviously, the Iranians consider themselves as the aggrieved party here, right? They um, complied with their obligations fully, uh, not just with the JCPOA, but even with the interim agreement that was signed in 2013. And they continued to fulfill their obligations even one year after Trump withdrew from the deal. Um, and, you know, they expected the Biden administration, who's staffed with the same people who negotiated the JCPOA, and came to office with the promise of returning to the deal uh, to move much quicker uh, and uh, to, to uh, basically um, uh, at least offer some sort of mea culpa, apology, regret for what has happened to Iran uh, in the past few years. Uh, and, and so because none of this happened, they're very frustrated uh, in general. And uh, it, there is now a debate taking place in Tehran uh, mirroring the debate that the Biden administration went through uh, over the past six weeks. And the debate in Tehran is about what's the best approach. Should, as Foreign Minister Zarif and President Rouhani argue, uh, Iran uh, demonstrate flexibility in order to find a solution and move forward um, while they're still in office until August of this year? Uh, or uh, should, as hardliners in Iran say, um, and the deep state, the supreme leader, the revolutionary guards that are of this opinion, the U.S. only understands the language of force, and so they should uh, continuously ratchet up the pressure on Washington to get sanctions relief. And this takes the form of nuclear escalation. We've seen in the past few weeks, Iran has uh, increased its uranium enrichment levels to 20%, which is perilously close to weapons grade. It has started producing uranium metals, uh, which is also, again, something that could be used in nuclear weapons. It is increasingly using advanced centrifuges. The kind of knowledge it acquires through that process is really not reversible. Um, and also, it has curtailed uh, the UN inspectors' access to Iran's nuclear facilities. And in parallel to this, you see uh, ratcheting up of tensions in the region. In Iraq, uh, there is pressure on US presence. Uh, rocket attacks on U.S. forces uh, have increased in the past few weeks. Um, we saw that uh, Houthis in Yemen uh, engaged in significant escalation against Saudi Arabia through another attack on Saudi Aramco. Um, uh, in uh, the, the Gulf of Oman, a, an Israeli ship uh, came under attack a few weeks ago. Um, and, and so, uh, in general, uh, tensions are uh, increasing uh, in a very dangerous way. Now, um, Iranians also have refused to uh, take part in an informal meeting that the Europeans uh, wanted to organize of all the original signatories of the deal, including uh, the U.S., uh, to, to try to discuss a way forward. Uh, and, you know, as a senior Iranian official told me, um, if they wanted to negotiate with the U.S. while the U.S. is enforcing maximum pressure, they, they would have negotiated with Trump. Um, so the Iranian expectation was that the U.S. would first have to demonstrate that it uh, is committed to the nuclear deal through lifting at least some of the sanctions. Uh, and since that didn't happen, Iranians would not uh, uh, talk to the U.S. administration. And again, in the lack of direct contact, and I can tell you uh, uh, for a fact that there is no negotiation happening right now uh, at any level behind closed doors officially. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, and, and that creates obviously a lot of uh, uh, misunderstandings and, and, and it provides a lot of room for miscommunication through intermediaries. But as desperate as the situation looks like right now, I think it is still salvageable uh, because at the end of the day, both sides want the same thing. Um, 
But there are a few things that are, uh, I think, 100% clear right now. First is that uh, a big for big kind of arrangement that the US or Iran would go back into full compliance and then the other side would move uh, is not going to happen. Um, most likely we have to start with much more modest incremental uh, steps uh, back into full compliance. Uh, the second uh, reality I think is that it's become clear that neither side would move first and wait for the other to reciprocate. That both sides would have to move in parallel uh, and steps would have to be synchronized. So with this in mind, I think the way that we can get out of this deadlock uh, is uh, not too complicated to, to uh, imagine. Uh, we have to start first with uh, basically breaking the stalemate, and that requires both sides to take at least one step uh, in the direction uh, of uh, returning to compliance. Uh, the details of this one step could be negotiated through intermediaries like the European Union, who is in charge of implementation of the JCPOA, or Switzerland, uh, which looks after U.S. Uh, interest in Iran. Um, and, you know, it would take the form of the U.S., for instance, allowing Iran to access some of its frozen assets in South Korea or in Iraq, which could be channeled uh, through a Swiss humanitarian channel. Uh, for purchase of humanitarian uh, goods, medicine, and uh, medical equipment, um, which is totally sellable in Washington as well uh, as a humanitarian gesture. Uh, and the Iranians would um, arrest one of the more proliferation-sensitive activities that they're engaged in, like 20% enrichment or, or something like that. I think that would allow then the informal meeting to take place because both sides have demonstrated that they're serious about return to uh, the JCPOA. Uh, and in the informal meeting, they have to negotiate two different things. One is an inter interim uh, arrangement or a freeze for freeze that basically would put more time on the clock for uh, the parties to be able to negotiate uh, a timetable for mutual return to compliance. And by an interim step, I mean that Iran would uh, freeze all of the activities that are uh, very dangerous on, on the nuclear side uh, and also would bring down the temperature in the region a little bit. And the U.S. would allow Iran to uh, you know, export a certain threshold of its oil and be able to repatriate uh, the revenues. And this would, uh, you know, by the three, two, three months time that is necessary to negotiate that timetable, and the timetable's implementation would also take two to three months. So all in all, um, I'm cautiously optimistic uh, that progress is possible uh, prior to President Rouhani leaving office in August. Um, it's definitely no longer possible before Iran's election in, in June, uh, but it is still possible before Rouhani leaves office. And I think it is in the U.S.'s interest to try to restore the agreement with the people who negotiated it on the Iranian side and are its uh, key advocates, rather than waiting for uh, uh, the likeliest scenario, which is the uh, JCPOA critics coming to office in Iran uh, as of August. Well, let uh, me let me jump in and ask you, because this is your, your beginning on the next question that I was going to ask, which is summer elections in Iran. Um, a lot of people are saying you've got to do this before the summer elections because more hardliners might come in. Is it true that do you think that more hardliners are that hardliners are likely to win in summer elections? And is that uh, bad um, for these negotiations or could it lead to a sort of a, a Nixon goes to China situation where you need a you need a republic, you need a, a, a security person who can bring the country forward on this on these sort of difficult negotiations? So that's a great question. And, you know, it has. Um, two different answers. One is about restoring the JCPOA, and there I have a very clear answer that I think it's much easier to do it with the Rouhani administration than with their successor. Uh, but when we start thinking about what comes next, the follow-on agreement, I think that it would actually be easier to negotiate it with a more hardline uh, government in Iran. And, and I know that's counterintuitive, but I, exp I explain it. Now, the reason I say it's easier to do it with the Rouhani administration is that you know, people matter in diplomacy. Um, it, it's not just about policies. And there are people in Washington who say, well, the supreme leader in Iran is never up for, for election, and he represents the continuity in decision-making in Iran. 
so who cares who the who the president is? But if you ask uh, uh, um, people who negotiated with uh, uh, Ahmadinejad's uh, representatives uh, in 2011 and 2012, and I was there and I, I witnessed this. Uh, they will tell you that it makes a huge difference, uh, uh, you know, who, who is sitting at, at the other side of the table. Um, you know, not just their uh, perspectives, but even simple things like language skills uh, really facilitate uh, negotiations when we're talking about something as complicated as, as the nuclear issue. Um, so uh, without any doubt, I think the institutional memory that is there right now in the Rouhani administration and their eagerness to restore the agreement before uh, they leave uh, uh, office uh, it is a great uh, facilitator for restoration of the JCPOA. But regardless of what happens to the JCPOA, uh, I think we can say with a, a high degree of confidence that the next Iranian president will be a conservative. But there are different shades of gray in the conservative camp. Um, and, and by the way, let me say the reason I say it will be a conservative is because uh, the Rouhani administration has failed, uh, uh, you know, so bad on so many policy uh, um, priorities, not just because of what happened to the JCPOA, but they, they really overpromised and underdelivered on the economic front, on sociopolitical reforms. Um, and as you know, uh, there have been several episodes of social unrest in Iran in the past few years, which has been brutally suppressed. And that has created a very bad uh, uh, impression of the Rouhani administration uh, and of the more moderate forces of Iranian politics. So all in all, I think it is almost guaranteed that there will be a more conservative president. And that also we are at a critical juncture in Iran's history because the biggest question internally is not JCPOA or who becomes president. It's really the succession of the supreme leader who's 82 years old and, um, you know, and is trying to plan for the transition to his successor. Uh, and as part of that agenda, I think the system wants a monolithic control over all instruments of power. Uh, you know, the, the hardliners took over the parliament last year, uh, and I think they want the presidency as well so that they can ensure that uh, who and what comes after the Supreme Leader is exactly in line uh, with their vision uh, and also to protect their vested political and economic interest in the system. So it will be a conservative, but it would, you know, the, there are different shades of gray and, and that depends a little bit on what happens between now and elections. If there's progress on the diplomatic front, I can imagine if there's a little bit of economic reprieve I can imagine that there will be more dynamism within the society and participation rates might go up. And usually with higher participation rates, uh, like everywhere in the world, including in this country, uh, uh, more moderate candidates have a better chance. Um, uh, and, you know, if there is stalemate, I think uh, there will be more political apathy. And so uh, participation rates will be lower and that would benefit the conservatives. Um, so. Why do I say that with a conservative president, it's easier to negotiate a um, follow on agreement? That's because the two things that bug down the Rouhani administration will no longer exist. One is the infighting over who reaps the political dividends of any progress on negotiations with the West, um, which by definition will bring about economic reprieve. Who takes credit for that? when conservatives are in control of all levers of power, that's no longer an issue. Second uh, is that there was also a lot of infighting in Iran because of uh, uh, mistrust between the deep state in Iran and Rouhani and Zarif who were seen as too soft on the West and too, too pro-Western in general. Uh, that would no longer be the case because again, uh, it will be the same party that is in control of all uh, institutions. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the short answer to your question is, it is, I think, in the U.S.'s interest to try to restore the deal as long as Rouhani is in office uh, and then try to negotiate a follow-on agreement with the next Iranian president. Okay, let me ask a final question before we move to the audience. Um, <clears throat> can the U.S. and its allies, and, and here I mean Israel and, and the Gulf countries, live with a rich Iran. And, and I asked that question because in 2015, when the Iran deal was initially being, being inked, a number of Israeli security people 
came out and said, you know, we're not so worried about the atom bomb and, and, and Iran getting nukes. We, we can bomb those uh, the way we did in Iraq and Syria. What really worries us is that Iran will be reintegrated in the international community. Sanctions are lifted and it gets rich. It sells all that incredible gas and oil and bankers rush in and they sell them high quality airplanes and other things. And uh, Iran will become infinitely more powerful than it is today. And its influence in countries like Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and so forth will increase dramatically. It's much better for us to have a poor Iran that's beleaguered by sanctions. Let them try to make nukes. They're not really that important. I mean, we don't like it, but the whole world has agreed that they shouldn't have nukes. But once they get in to the economy, they're going to become addicted to Iran. And they're never going to want to put sanctions back on, even if Iran you know, continues to do things we don't like. And um, how, do you, how do you convince people in Washington, who probably sh many people share that view, that letting Iran out of sanctions when the mullahs are still in control is, um, is something America can afford to do? Well, I, I would say look at the record of the past two and a half years. Um, you know, uh, this is no longer a hypothetical because we've actually seen the record of maximum pressure. So the Trump administration had this idea that if you deprive Iran of the resources that it, use, uh, it uses to advance its regional agenda, by definition, you will contain uh, uh, Iran's activities in the region. Um, well, uh, the, the administration, the Trump administration managed to, uh, you know, uh, impose a huge economic cost on Iran. Um, the country has had three years of economic contraction. But according to uh, uh, Israeli Defense Forces, uh, just as of two weeks ago, they published a report in which they said there has been zero change in Iran's uh, financial support to Hezbollah in Lebanon. And there has actually been an increase in Iranian support to militias in uh, Iraq and in Yemen. Um, and the reason is that, you know, and if you, by the way, it's not just the past two and a half years, you look at the record of 40 years of economic performance in Iran and 40 years of Iran's regional activities. Uh, and you um, and we've actually published something on this uh, with with data. Um, and you see that there is no correlation between the two, because what drives Iran's regional policy uh, is not how much money it has in its bank account. Its regional policy has been designed to be very low cost through support for proxies and partners throughout the region. Uh, Iran's regional policy is driven by threat perception and opportunities. So, uh, you know, U.S. invades Iraq, destabilizes Iraq, creates an opportunity for Iran to increase its influence uh, in, in Iraq. Um, same thing in Yemen uh, in 2015. Same thing in Lebanon after Israel invaded it in 1982. Um, you know, and, and there's also the question of threat perceptions, uh, because, again, Iran sees its ballistic missiles program and its support for proxies and partners in the region as its core defensive policies. So the more they are th threatened through sanctions and, you know, covert operations and military pre pressure, the more they double down on what they feel is critical to their national security. But, you know, you're absolutely right. I've always believed and I've said this since, uh, 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 you know, the, the debates about JCPOA were taking place in Washington in 2015, 2016, uh, that, you know, the, the JCPOA's critics' biggest problem with the deal is not uranium enrichment. It's Iranian enrichment. Uh, and, you know, by definition, when you say we're not going to provide Iran with any rewards for restricting its nuclear program or, um, um, you know, uh, accepting rigorous inspections of its nuclear activities, by definition, you're saying you don't want a deal, uh, that no deal is better than any deal. Uh, and if that's your approach, well, you have to accept that there is the other side also gets gets to vote. Right. And we've seen in the past two and a half years, the U.S. and Iran came to the verge of a military confrontation three times after uh, Iranians shot down a U.S. drone after Iran uh, allegedly was behind an attack on Saudi Aramco um, and after uh, uh, the U.S. killed Soleimani and Iran retaliated with missile attacks. So I don't think that's really uh, the approach that uh, uh, is going to bear us uh, any benefits. If we want Iran to change its regional policy, uh, we should, um, first of all, 
trying to answer this critical question. Yes, there is a ceiling to how much influence Iran could have in the region that would be acceptable to us and to uh, allies in the region. But there's also a floor to how much influence Iran could have in the region. You know, we can't cut out Iran from the region. It's part of the region, it's of the region. And so we have to come up with a formula that is acceptable both to the Iranians and to their neighbors. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and also try to uh, address this question of whether Iran has some legitimate security concerns. Uh, and if we can answer those two questions, I think we can figure out a formula uh, that could uh, integrate Iran in the region uh, in a non-zero-sum formula. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, switch to audience questions. Rasha Awada asks, Europe's inability to act independently of the U.S., maximum pressure campaign and mitigate sanctions has negatively impacted its relations with Iran. So how, how do you see the future of EU-Iran relations under the Biden administration? Do you see it changing in any way, having more authority, or is it just a, uh, you know, is it just an adjunct to America? Um, so that's a good question. Look, uh, the, the European countries, I think, provided uh, critical and indispensable support for the JCPOA, political support. On the economic front, they really failed to stand up to the U.S. because, you know, you know, the Europeans woke up one day and realized that they have no economic sovereignty, that their companies at the end of the day care more about what U.S. regulators uh, say than their own. Um, and uh, that is a fact that uh, a lot of European governments are now dealing with. But I don't think we can uh, disregard and, and overlook uh, the, the critical role that the, U, that the Europeans played to try to keep the JCPOA alive when the Trump administration was doing everything in its power uh, to undermine it. But uh, because of failure on the economic side, uh, uh, they have uh, suffered uh, a lot uh, uh, in terms of credibility in the eyes of the Iranians. And by the way, this is not the first time, it's the second time. In 2003 to 2005, Iranians negotiated with France, Britain, and Germany, suspended their enrichment in the hope that the, that the Europeans would be able to offer them economic uh, incentives, uh, which they failed to do because John Bolton at the time was sitting at the State Department uh, and obstructed their ability uh, from delivering on their promises to the Iranians. So the Iranians, I think, have come to believe that Europe is uh, basically not independent. Uh, it always follows the United States. Um, but, you know, uh, the alternatives to Europe for Iran, especially when it gets to trade, are not that much more attractive either. I mean, it's usually uh, Asian countries which do not have the same quality of products that Iranians can get from Germany or from France. Um, there is much more cultural affinity between the Iranians and the Europeans than it is the case between the Iranians and the Chinese or the Russians. Um, you know, for instance, there is there was this uh, saying in Iran that uh, during the sanctions, uh, both under the Obama administration and during Trump uh, administration, uh, you know, the Chinese had this arrangement with Iran, which was called oil for junk. Uh, that basically Iran was selling them oil and in return they were selling low quality goods to the Iranians. And as soon as sanctions were lifted in 2016, you saw that a lot of contracts with the Chinese were dropped and the Iranians switched back to, to the Europeans. So I expect that uh, at least the, the private sectors uh, on both sides would like to restore relations. But I think uh, politically, the Europeans would never um, uh, reach the same level of trust and credibility in the eyes of Iranian decision makers uh, that they had in the past. Um, thank you. Here's a question from Mohammed bin Jabir, um, which brings up many, I think, of many Middle Eastern anxieties about a, um, a, a, an Iran that's not under sanction. Iran supports militias in Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, Bahrain and it destabilizes a weak government and establishes governments that will be obedient to it. Iran wants to dominate the region. This is their ideology. Will the United States give Iran this wish as a prize for Iran giving up its nuclear power? What, what can Iranians say to their Arab neighbors, their Sunni Arab neighbors who deeply distrust them? 
Yeah, that's a very important question. Look, um, I think one has to first understand what's the motivation uh, behind Iran's regional policies. And again, if you come to the conclusion that Iran wants to dominate the region, you come up with one set of answers. If you um, uh, uh, see it as, as I described, as as a response to the to the threat perceptions that Iran has, then you come up with a with a different set of answers. I don't think um, you know Iranian domination of the of the region is realistic. Uh, I mean, can you really imagine a Shia Persian nation dominating uh, Sunni Arab countries in the region or? Uh, you know, Turkey, uh, uh, Sunni Turkey, uh, Turkish uh, uh, um, state, uh, it's really unrealistic. Uh, and that's the inherent uh, ceiling to Iranian influence uh, in the region. Um, so what Iran does is because if you're trying to put yourself in the, in the shoes of an Iranian policymaker or, or a strategic analyst, uh, what you see around yourself is uh, lots of U.S. bases, um, you know, every day you look off your shores in the Persian Gulf, you see a 50,000 strong armada. Um, and the U.S. is the real hegemon of the region. Um, you know, from a conventional military perspective, Iran is much weaker than most of its neighbors. Um, the UAE, which is the size of a small province in Iran, um, has a much stronger air force than the Iranian air force, which dates back from the time of the Shah, is basically a flying museum. It's not an air force. Um, and Iran, unlike Turkey, who's a member of NATO or, you know, uh, GCC countries, is not a member of any kind of security arrangement. It's on its own. It's the only country in the region that looks after its own security. And it's not like Pakistan, a nuclear power, or like Israel, a nuclear power. So if you're encircled, um, and, um, you know, from a conventional military perspective, can't really defend yourself, what are your options? And the two options that the Iranians have come up with are their ballistic missile program and what they call the forward defense policy, which is this idea that you extend your borders that you cannot protect uh, by basically buying strategic depth, right? You have, I mean, once a senior Israeli official told me, for us, Iran is a thousand kilometers away. For Iran, Israel is 10 meters away from across the Lebanese border. Uh, and the Iranians believe that the reason Israel, a much stronger military power, has actually never attacked them uh, is because they're not afraid of Iran. They're afraid of hundreds of thousands of uh, Hezbollah missiles that are targeting uh, Israeli states, uh, Israeli cities. So um, if you look at it from a perspective of uh, the Iranians, they see this as critical to their security and they don't have a viable alternative. You know, we tell the Iranians give up your ballistic missile program, stop supporting uh, Hezbollah and the Houthis and others, while we, at the same time, are selling billions of dollars of sophisticated weapons to all of their neighbors. Um, you know, so that, that is a logic that doesn't work. And as long as uh, you know, the balance of power in the region remains the same, or Iranian threat perception remains the same, I'm afraid, regardless of whether you have sanctions relief, uh, you offer sanctions relief to Iran or you don't, uh, you know, the, the same situation will continue. OK, um, let me ask you a question to. Uh, Alan Levinson, who is a distinguished professor here at OU, head of the Jewish studies, um, <clears throat> writes, uh, I have never understood the opportunity elements in Iran's policy. What benefit does Iran get from intervention in Yemen? Well, I mean, this is a good example, actually. Um, so um, the opportunity in Yemen uh, was offered. Iran didn't start a civil war in Yemen. Uh, it started because Saudi Arabia did not manage uh, a, a transitional government uh towards something that was that all political actors and stakeholders in Yemen believed that it would look after their interests. And so it led to a civil war uh, that the Iranians tried to exploit. Uh, the Saudis intervened and that uh, increased the Iranian opportunities uh, for exploiting that conflict. Why did Iran do this? Because at the same time, another thing was happening. Uh, and Joshua is an expert on this, uh, the Syrian civil war in which um, uh, Saudis, Emiratis, the Qataris, the Turks, 
everybody else would all, was also supporting proxies in order to destabilize the Syrian regime and cut Iran's hand in the Levant, right? So, and look at the Syrian uh, dynamic. It was extremely costly for the Iranians in blood, treasure, reputation on the Arab streets. Um, it was very low cost investment for the Saudis. Um, you know, supporting a bunch of Salafi groups uh, wasn't that costly. So the Iranians basically retaliated by doing the exact same thing in Saudi Arabia's backyard. Uh, it, the support for Houthis is very low cost uh, and it has resulted in great benefits for the Iranians. It has bugged down the Saudis into a very costly uh, conflict with no light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, it has cost them uh, reputation, uh, their reputation in, in, in the US and in Europe. Um, and uh, uh, obviously it's been extremely damaging, created the worst humanitarian situation uh, anywhere in the world. So, um, uh, you know, uh, but, and, and then over time, this became something else. Uh, the, the Saudis, as of uh, 2018, when the Trump administration reimposed sanctions, uh, they basically helped uh, make up for the lack of Iranian oil uh, exports on the market. That's why the oil prices didn't really uh, 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 increase significantly when Iran's uh, 2.5 million barrels were removed from the market. Um, and, uh, and, and that's why the Iranians saw the Houthis as, uh, a, as a tool that they could use to uh, impose a cost on Saudi support for maximum pressure. That's why the Aramco attack happened. That's why the uh, attack on tankers in the Gulf and um, uh, you know in the in the port of Fujairah and uh, the UAE happened. So you know, uh, un unfortunately, we we live in a um, uh, political atmosphere about Iran uh, that you know Iran is the no new Soviet Union. It's const constantly demonized. It's uh, uh, it's constantly assessed in a black and white uh, kind of situation. Um, uh, and that often deprives us from the ability uh, to understand, to try to put ourselves in the shoes of our adversaries uh, and see whether their actions are actually a reaction to some of the things that we do. Uh, and, and so that's why I'm, uh, what I'm trying to, to, to bring to the table. It's not necessarily to defend their position, but it's to, to help us understand uh, that you know, if we uh, strangulate them, uh, through sanctions, uh, you know, through constantly talking about regime change, uh, through, um, you know, covert operations. Last year, the critical infrastructure in Iran was going boom all the time. Uh, Iranian nuclear facilities were being sabotaged. Iranian nuclear scientists were being killed. Iranian generals were being assassinated. Uh, and, you know, a country like Iran would eventually have to lash out. And, and this is one of uh, its manifestations. Okay. Um, you know, you've explained well Iran's interest with Hezbollah, which in a sense has become Iran's air force uh, because the missiles in, in southern Lebanon act as a deterrence Absolutely. against Israel's air force potentially bombing Iran. Or at least that's the, that's the hope on Iran's side. You've explained Yemen. What about Syria? We, we have a, um, a question from, uh, from Rayyan Asayid who says, this is she is a, a Syrian and sociology student living in Sweden and asks, would the Iran election affect Iranian existence in Syria, their presence in Syria? What is the what is Iran's interest in Syria? And uh, what how do you see the future of their relationship with Syria um, in the next five years? Um, excellent question. Look, uh, first of all, um, Iran's involvement in the Syrian crisis uh, uh, can be traced back to uh, the fear that the Iranians had uh, with the uh, Arab uprisings in 2011, 2012, uh, that the alternative to the Assad regime in the way that the conflict, uh, the, that the civil unrest was developing into a civil war uh, is not necessarily, uh, you know, going to be a more democratic uh, Syrian system, but it it's going to be similar to what has happened in Libya, uh, a state of chaos uh, and a replacement of Syria, Syrian regime with a 
uh, either uh, you know a, a pro Saudi, pro Israeli, or a Salafi uh, extremist regime that would create a black hole between uh, two key Iranian allies in the region, Lebanon and Iraq, uh, and this black hole will bas basically uh, you know uh, pull in uh, Iraq and, and Lebanon as well, and so the dominoes would start falling. Uh, and once again, Iran will be encircled. And, and you have to remember that this sense of, this fear of encirclement is really rooted in the 1980 to 88 Iran-Iraq war, uh, when Iran was basically fighting Iraq, which was supported by most of the region and world powers on its own. And that sense of solitude is uh, the informative experience of most of Iranian leaders who are still in power today. Uh, and, and so that was a big fear for the Iranians, and they decided that regardless of the cost, they would support uh, the, the Syrian regime, uh, including, uh, for instance, something that was really shocking, which was to close their eyes uh, on Assad's use of chemical weapons uh, uh, the, the, uh, that the Iranians have been the biggest victim of uh, in, this uh, in, uh, in, in the 20th century after um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the world wars. So, um, but, but again, this was in their eyes critical in order to uh, preserve their forward defense policy because, again, Syria has always been their conduit to Hezbollah and without Syria, they were worried that this whole infrastructure that they put together will unravel. Um, now, that is a state policy. It is not a government policy. In fact, my research uh, shows that, um, and this is again a counterintuitive, but when there was a debate at Iran's Supreme National Security Council, which unlike uh, the National Security Council here, is actually bringing together all uh, different uh, uh, branches of government uh, together. So you have the Speaker of Parliament, you have the um, uh, Chief of Judiciary, you have all the key military and civilian uh, stakeholders at the table. Um, when, they won when they were voting about whether Iran should support Assad or not, uh, uh, they, they got into a stalemate and, and the swing vote was uh, from uh, Ali Larjani, who at the time was a Speaker of Parliament and is seen uh, widely as a more moderate uh, figure uh, versus Pre President Ahmadinejad, uh, who is seen as a uh, you know, crazy hardliner. Ahmadinejad was in favor of supporting uh, the uh, um, uh, movement to topple Assad because he believed that this would help Iran have consistency in its key message that uh, the Arab uprisings were modeled after the Iranian revolution. Uh, but, um, but they voted and uh, the, the, the um, uh, forces who were in supporting uh, uh, intervention in Syria won the day uh, and that became state policy, remains state policy regardless of who's president. Again, some of these things I think are, um, you know, uh, consistent because uh, of lack of better strategic alternatives. So it doesn't matter who's president. You can't really, I've never talked to an Iranian official, hardliner, softliner, reformist, conservative, who um, uh, believes that Iran has any other option uh, rather than uh, supporting Hezbollah or uh, its, uh, its ballistic missiles. Um, and so I don't think we would see any significant change. There might be a change in tone, but in terms of uh, practical policies, uh, I don't expect to see any change. Um, hang on just a second. Let me bring myself back on. Um, hang on. Um, can you hear me, Dr. Voice? I can, yes. All you right. Lost Joshua, right? Yeah, I know. Joshua had a, some sort of a technical issue. He had to, he was kicked off, but he's trying to get back. Let me uh, bring you another question from on our audience. And hang on. Um, um, so um, Robert Andrew uh, from University of Oklahoma asks, assuming that the US and Iran come to some sort of reapproachment with the new JCPOA, what is next on the agenda? How can we ever normalize this relationship? How long will it take? Um, yeah, so uh, look, I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, um, restoring the JCPOA, uh, which is the only uh, comprehensive agreement that the two countries have been able to sign in the past 43 years, 
uh, I think is the sine qua non, is the prerequisite for any future progress. Because, you know, with leverage, you can get the other side to the negotiating table. But if you want to keep them at the negotiating table, you need at least uh, a, a, a little bit of trust that you're a credible negotiating partner. And the U.S., with what Trump did, I think has already undermined uh, its own position. Um, uh, you know, if, if the Iranians, or for that matter, the North Koreans, or anybody else believes that uh, the deals that the U.S. signs on to are as uh, good as the administration uh, who has uh, uh, agreed to them, uh, uh, the lifetime of the administration who has agreed to them, uh, then, uh, you know, it, I, I, I think we will have real difficulty in international diplomacy. So first is the restoration of the JCPOA. <clears throat> then, you know, as I said, um, the U.S. can go to Iran and say, look, um, this deal has already proven to be unstable. Uh, there's a lot of opposition to it. There's a lot of criticism to it in the U.S. Uh, and you, Iranians, you were also not satisfied with it in 2016. The sanctions relief fell short of what you expected, which demonstrates the need to provide <coughs> more sanctions relief to the Iranians, including some of the primary embargo that the U.S. has put in place. Now, <coughs> excuse me, that means um, that, um, you know, the U.S. can say we should negotiate a more for more <coughs> or a better for better kind of arrangement. And again, I think that's totally feasible. <clears throat> but there is a negative incentive that the U.S. can also put on the table. And I would argue the United States leverage is not in the form of Trump sanctions, but in the now proven ability of the United States to turn the sanction switch on and off on our own to great effect on the Iranian economy. Uh, and, uh, you know, that leverage is going to be there a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. And so the U.S. can definitely tell the Iranians if by 2023, when some of the limitations in the deal will start expiring, and we enter the next round of electoral uh, cycle uh, in the U.S., <clears throat> if by that point there is no follow-on agreement, we will have no choice other than reimposing sanctions. And so with this negative incentive and the positive incentive of a more-for-more, more, an arrangement that would benefit both sides, um, I, I think one can uh, move forward on, uh, on, on a follow-on nuclear agreement. But when it gets to the regional dynamics, um, you know, I think, uh, and Jake Sullivan, who's national security advisor now, uh, in the summer wrote an, uh, uh, an opinion piece in Foreign Affairs in which he said there are two short-term priorities for the Biden administration. One is to de-escalate the conflict in Yemen, and second is to uh, restore the JCPOA. And then he said... Uh, the next step would be to start a regional dialogue process uh, in the region that would result in general de-escalation and help the countries figure out a way of living with one another, some sort of a modus vivendi, right? Because in the Persian Gulf region, uh, you know, it's the only part in the world that there is no, no uh, region-wide inclusive institution. You know, in Africa, you have the African Union. In Europe, you have the European Union. Uh, you know, you have the Organization of Americas in South America. Uh, there's nothing in the Persian Gulf. Uh, and so you really have to start from scratch. Uh, and the administration, I think, has learned the lesson of the mistakes that the Obama administration committed, which was to uh, tackle the ur urgent concern about Iran's nuclear program first, and then try to tackle important issues like regional security. Uh, and they've come to the conclusion that the best way of doing this uh, is not sequential, but simultaneous. Um, so uh, while they're tr talking to Iran on a longer and stronger and stronger nuclear deal in the P5 plus one format, they also need to support a process in which Iran, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, uh, Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, these countries all get together uh, and try to see if they can address their mutual threat perceptions uh, and figure out an, a, a security arrangement uh, that uh, they're all comfortable with. The U.S. would not be able to lead this process, but it can definitely support it. Uh, it's much better if uh, it's led by a more neutral actor like the United Nations or a core group of European states. 
But I think that's the way forward, that uh, in addition to the nuclear issue, uh, you try in parallel uh, to try to address uh, uh, the, the, the regional concerns. And again, if it's not seen as a zero sum that we, lo we win, Iran loses kind of arrangement, um, um, you know, I, I think progress could be made. Right. So to recap everything, let's, uh, I'm going to take you back to where you started talking about the regional importance of Iran and its role in the regional politics and how it sees itself as one of the players, major play players in the Middle East. Um, Mr. Jimmy Morales asks, related to a previous question, is there any chance of re-approachment between Saudi Arabia and Iran as a result of re-entering the JCPOA and more specifically, and a follow-up agreement, specific, especially if we're to believe Soleimani was on his way to address exactly that, easing Sunni-Shia relationships? Um, that's a very good question. Um, you know, in um, in the past few weeks, uh, there was a joint op-ed by an Iranian and uh, uh, Saudi uh, uh, senior uh, experts, uh, and and they offered uh, a, a mirror image of uh, their threat perceptions uh, and a few principles that could be guiding uh, future discussions between Iran and Saudi Arabia. You know, I think the biggest obstacle to uh, Iran-Saudi uh, rapprochement so far uh, has been the United States, to be honest with you, because uh, the Saudis have always believed that the U.S. would act as their proxy in trying to contain Iran and create a more leveled uh, playing field, um, because the Saudis believe that Iran is in the ascendancy, it's extended its uh, influence in the region, uh, and uh, believed for a very long time that the U.S. would be able to bloody their nose and basically cut them down in size uh, and, and, and contain them. And that's when the Saudis would be able to negotiate with the Iranians. Well, we've seen again that uh, the record of the past few years under the Trump administration demonstrated that that kind of approach only makes Iran more aggressive in the region, more repressive at home. Uh, and so the only solution uh, is really if the U.S. is to push the Saudis towards finding a mutually acceptable arrangement uh, with the Iranians. Um, and, you know, you see already that uh, uh, countries like the UAE, who are always a bit more pragmatic, uh, have come to the conclusion that, uh, you know, this kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, coercive policy towards Iran will create the kind of cost that they have to pay for. Um, you know, uh, because they're Iran's neighbor, and if Iran is going to lash out, uh, they will be among the first targets. Uh, and so they've already started de-escalating uh, with the Iranians on opening channels of communication. I think with some support and pressure from the Biden administration, the Saudis would also come to a similar conclusion. But again, as I said, uh, you know, there is a bilateral level uh, de-escalation that could happen between these countries. But at the end of the day, you need a region-wide arrangement because this region has a lot of asymmetries, uh, some inherent, like the size of different countries. Some countries are, you know, tiny and some countries are much bigger. Uh, size of population, you know, depth of statehood, national identity, um, uh, uh, energy resources, etc., uh, and, and then there are artificial asymmetries in the form of conventional military uh, capabilities that I discussed before. Uh, so all of these have to be addressed in a regional dialogue that, again, I know the Biden administration is very supportive of. But, you know, there is a linkage between uh, all of the issues that we've discussed today. Uh, without progress on the nuclear file, I don't think you can have a, a successful regional dialogue. And without uh, stabilizing the region more, I don't think you can have a stable nuclear agreement. Uh, and that's why these issues would have to be addressed uh, all uh, in parallel and at the same time. Uh, and again, I'm cautiously optimistic that with the U.S. support, uh, the Saudis uh, would be much more willing to engage in that kind of discussion with, with the Iranians. Um, can you, am I back on this? Yes, can you hear me? see okay. you. I'm very sorry for that. And um, forgive me, I was listening to you on the phone and you, you didn't miss a beat, Marjan. Thank you so much. Um, you know, we're almost at our end. Uh, let me ask you, Ali, 
in conclusion, how optimistic you are uh, for the future of these talks. Um, do you still feel that there's a lot of goodwill in Washington for moving forward on this? Um, you know, I am cautiously optimistic uh, because, you know, again, I've been in situations in the past where it appeared that, uh, you know, both sides were totally stuck and there's no way forward and the gap between them was totally unbridgeable. And because at the end of the day, they wanted the same thing. And more importantly, the alternatives were much less palatable. Uh, progress was eventually made. But having said this, uh, we are at a critical juncture in the sense that I think if the current deadlock is not resolved in the next, uh, let's say, uh, three to four weeks, uh, it probably will not be resolved uh, before uh, the next Iranian president comes to office, because as of mid-April, uh, the Iran's electoral cycle starts in full force. Uh, and uh, the concern is, uh, you know, if, if you look at the record of the past six weeks and what has happened in the region and the kind of the posturing that has further enriched, enriched uh, sorry, entrenched both sides and their positions, uh, if you, you know, corroborate that to six months until the next Iranian president is installed and can start negotiations, I'm afraid that a lot of bad things would happen. A lot of black swans could emerge. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, bipartisan statements uh, could be submitted in Washington. That would actually make future negotiations much more difficult. So, um, uh, again, I, I think progress is possible in the next few weeks. Uh, but, you know, uh, if, if it doesn't happen, then I think we have to tighten up our belts and try to survive until uh, next fall. Well, Ali Baez, thank you so much for a really interesting conversation and, uh, and really taking us around the region to, to think about how Iran looks at the regional security, its regional security, and the United States in that. So thank you so much. And I thank our audience who have been really wonderful in, in uh, asking so many good questions. And um, to all of you, uh, good night. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. You're yeah. welcome. Good night, all.